Take out your Bibles. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. And I just want to share with you this evening a favorite passage of mine. Let me read to you our text for this evening, Philippians 3, 20 and 21. This is God's word through the Apostle Paul to the Philippians. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. I want you to imagine for a moment that it's just an ordinary day. You wake up and you pour your cornflakes and you begin to eat them. You tie your shoes, you make your plans, you are making plans perhaps to meet friends or to go to work or to school, and a message arrives at your desk. And the message simply says that you have been declared a citizen of a country you've never heard of. You do a little bit of research, a Google search, you find out that this country has a bustling economy, abundant resources, peace within, enemies, uh, no enemies without, and no crime. It is idyllic. The weather is perfect. The topography is perfect. It's everything you've looked for in the perfect place. It's what you imagine on your desktop screensaver. Beaches everywhere, snow-capped mountains in the middle, no mosquitoes, no humidity, and no mayonnaise. I mean, this place is perfect. You discover that this land has a very strict immigration policy. No immigration. The only people who get to live there are the people born there. And the more you do your research, the more you discover that the best part of this strange country is its government. This country is governed by an absolute monarch. And he is a king like no other. He has absolute control over the country but his is a governance of kindness towards his subjects. He is humble, personable, friendly. And he wants to bring you there. This would change the way you eat your Cheerios, your cornflakes. This would change the way you think when you're tying your shoes and making your plans for the day. This would change the way you make friends. This would probably change how you pursue marriage, or how you go to school, or the kinds of things you spend your time with. What career would you choose? How would you raise your kids? And Christian, what I've just described to you is no tall tale. It is your story. It is your story. We discover in Philippians 3, 20 to 21 that a Christian is a citizen of a place he's never been. And that's the reminder I want to give you this evening from Philippians chapter 3. I'll give you three reminders up front, and then we'll walk through these one by one. First, we belong to heaven. Secondly, we wait for Jesus. And thirdly, we will be changed. That is the outline for this evening. These are three reminders that radically affect everyday life. And these are reminders of the truths of your life, if you're a believer in Christ. Notice in verse 20, we begin with the word for. This is explanatory. And Paul is going to explain a contrast between the perspective that's in verses 20 and 21 and the verses that come before. Look up at verse 17. Paul says, brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, of whom I've often told you, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. In the immediate context here, in verse 17, Paul encourages the Philippian believers to follow him, to follow him and his associates, 
And particularly in this letter, a a letter that is commending joy in Christ in the midst of suffering, you may remember that Paul is writing this letter to the Philippians from jail. He is imprisoned for the sake of the gospel, and he writes a letter to them about joy. And he says, follow me. Uh, Pattern your life after me. And and that's an interesting thing. Um, If I want to be like Paul when I grow up, does 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 that mean I'm going to go to jail too? And yes, there is a suffering for Christ that Paul was committed to, and it cost him. And he was incarcerated for following Christ and proclaiming Christ. And by contrast, he says, follow us, but don't follow these other guys. Verse 18, there are many who walk, of whom I've often told you, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. I believe that the people that Paul is enjoining the Philippian believers to not follow are professing Christians. I don't think he's talking about the world here. I don't think the the world would have been an attractive uh, leadership for the Philippian believers. He's not having to warn the Philippian believers, don't do what the world does. I think he's giving a warning here and he's even weeping over these ones. He sort of has to out their internal motivations for the Philippian believers to give them a warning about the dangers of following these other kind of Christians. A worldly perspective is not a danger to the Philippian church in this way, but those professing Christians that the Philippian believers are tempted to follow, that Paul weeps over, he describes them here as enemies of the cross of Christ. What is the cross of Christ about? Take up your cross and follow me. Self-denial, pain, suffering, difficulty. Oh, sure, they would be glad to follow Christ if it meant adding Christ to your life gives you your best life now. They, they surely would love that. These Philippian infiltrators, by contrast, are described this way in verse 9. Their end is destruction... Their God is their appetite. Their glory is in their shame. They set their minds on earthly things. This is a description of believers, professing believers, even professing believing teachers infiltrating the Philippian church that need to be warned about because they are motivated contrary to appearances. They have likely flipped Philippians 1.21. You know, Paul said there, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. They are the ones who are saying, well, yeah, for me to die is gain. I said it wrong. For me to live is gain. And when I die, I get Christ. It's sort of they want their cake and eat it too. I, I want to live the way I want to live now. I want to live my best life now. I can have peace and prosperity and comfort And you just think about what this would mean for Paul in his ministry. He already acknowledged that there were those who preached the gospel, not from pure motives, and Paul was willing to rejoice that the gospel was preached, even if the motives were foul. But for Paul to be in jail, legitimately suffering for proclamation, a pure proclamation of Christ, and and living out the consequences of being faithful to him, and then watching the Philippian believers Tempted to follow people who said, you don't have to suffer and you can be a Christian. You can live comfortably and be a Christian. And notice these descriptions. Their God is their appetite. What does that mean? That means they follow whatever they want right now. That, that's whom they're really serving. Their glory is in their shame. That is their boasting about the things they think they have license for. They're glorying in things that ought to be shameful. And it's the kind of Christian that says, yeah, I'm not a legalist. Look what I can do. He said they set their minds on earthly things. And notice the first part of verse 19. Their end is destruction. What is the terminus of this kind of Christian living? The kind that says, oh yeah, I I, I want Christ. I want my sins forgiven. I want my get out of hell free card. But, you know, I want to set my mind on earthly things. I want to live for the world too. I, I got a foot here and a foot there and maybe I can get the best of both. 
What does Paul say the end of these guys is? Destruction. And this is why Paul reminds the Philippian believers about them weeping. They're living a worldly carpe diem. Seize the day. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Get it all now. Paul says, don't follow them. Why? Verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. We belong to heaven. Your citizenship means that you are a registered citizen of a place you've never been, and the only place you've ever known is not where you belong. We saw this this morning. We we are aliens and strangers here in this life. Where's home? Where, Where do we belong? Where is our citizenship? It is in heaven. In 49 BC, all Italians were declared Roman citizens. By 47 AD, that's about 100 years later, only 9% of people in the Roman Empire were citizens. That's a low percentage. And so citizenship was highly prized. It was more than simply status. It was a way of life. It, it came with many privileges. Sometimes citizenship was purchased. Sometimes you were native-born, born into citizenship status. Sometimes it was granted to foreigners uh, who had fought for Rome in wars. Sometimes it was granted to foreigners out of appreciation for some accomplishment on the benefit of the empire. And many times it was granted to veterans. Philippi was a colony of Rome, and it was, a, it was colonized by relocated veterans. In fact, when the Roman Empire uh, wanted to reward some of its best uh, uh, fighters, It placed them all together in Philippi, displaced the local residents, gave the Roman soldiers their homes and their lands, and made them instantly wealthy. Gave them instant social status. So the Philippian believers would appreciate this word citizenship. The very city of Philippi was known as a little Rome. It was more than 600 miles from Rome in Greece on the Aegean Sea. But its administration reflected that of Rome almost entirely. From its architecture to the way it viewed its class systems and its hierarchy of status symbols, Philippi was indeed a little Rome. So for Paul to declare to the Philippian believers, you are citizens of heaven, significant. It means their belonging was to the place they'd never been. Many of these uh, Philippian veterans had never been to Rome itself, but they were citizens of Rome and lived in the little Rome. You and I have not yet been to heaven, but we are governed by heaven's priorities, heaven's values, heaven's ways of thinking about the world. Notice what Paul says about this, our citizenship is is in heaven. That present tense is significant. He doesn't say your citizenship will be in heaven. This is akin to Ephesians 2.6. We are presently seated in the heavenlies, Colossians 1.13. We have been transferred into the kingdom of God's beloved son. That means our present life is governed. Our rule of life is heavenly. Our priorities are heavenly. Our passions are heavenly. And our true possessions are heavenly heavenly. And this citizenship is by birth, by new birth, and new birth alone. We must be born from above. It is not only by birth, it is also by blood, that is by Jesus' blood. What qualifies us to be citizens of heaven? It is to belong to Christ to have been purchased by him in his work at the cross. It is to have surrendered to him in faith. Christianity is not just a different way to live, some set of moral structures to abide by. It is a totally new identity, a totally new belonging. You belong to another realm. The holiness and morality that comes from belonging to Christ, this set-apartedness, is the result of our belonging to another realm. We take on this heavenly citizenship that defines who we are. Are you homesick for your permanent residence? 
Do you miss that place called home you've never yet been? Is your life governed by the priorities and passions of heaven? It may be that you haven't yet experienced a change of citizenship. There's a second reminder in this text that radically affect everyday life, ought to affect the way we wake up and eat our breakfast cereal and tie our shoes and make our friends and pursue a spouse and chase a career and make money and recreate. And it is this phrase in verse 20, from which also we eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We belong to heaven and we wait for Jesus. We wait for Jesus. From heaven, we eagerly await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Savior. We're waiting for a Savior. You you know that in the New Testament, salvation can be described as a past tense event, a, a present reality, an ongoing reality, and a future hope. We have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. All of those are ways to describe our salvation, and none of them negate the fact that salvation is a point-in-time event that God accomplishes by His grace. And yet it is also true that we are presently in the process of being rescued from that which we have been saved. And a final consummation, a final salvation is that glorification event. That's what's in view here this future event, we eagerly await a Savior. And notice he is uh, called here uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. We await a Savior who is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Lord, that is, he's the Lord of the universe. He's also Lord of my life. He is a sovereign master, and that has personal implications for me. And he is Jesus, that is, the man, the man from Nazareth, the 100% truly human, and he is the Christ. And not a last name, that's his title. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one, the promised one, the one who came to crush the head of the snake, to reverse the curse, to rescue his people from death and from slavery. To await the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, to await Him in eager expectation. This word for waiting occurs eight times in the New Testament, all of them looking forward eschatologically, that is, to the end times, to the return of Christ. To to, to look ahead to that which is coming. What does that look like? What does it look like to eagerly await Christ? How do we do that? Anticipation, waking up every morning saying, could it be today? Obedience, not wanting to be caught unawares, right? One of Jonathan Edwards' resolutions was resolved always to do those things which I would love to be seen doing when Christ returns. Do you think about that? If Christ came back in this moment, would he be pleased? Would I be seen as a faithful steward caring about my master's business? Anticipation, obedience. It also means a longing. Thy kingdom come. That's how Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Or the closing prayer of the Bible. Come, Lord Jesus. And faith. Waiting on God is faith multiplied by time. Trusting in him and trusting in Him the next moment, and trusting in Him the next moment. And often that's hard when our circumstances don't change and they're disagreeable to us. That waiting on God is a lost art in the Christian life. And this eagerly waiting for Christ is the fundamental heartbeat of what it means to be a Christian. I got my sins forgiven, and I love my Savior, and I can't wait to see Him. That is the fundamental impulse of the Christian life. And we forget and we get distracted, and we go about our earthly business, and we need to be reminded. Heaven is home, and we wait for Jesus. Waiting is hard. Waiting is not idle. Waiting is not sitting around twiddling your thumbs. I'll never forget my dad looking at clouds in the sky, especially some dramatic storm on the horizon, a a good pop-up thunderstorm on a Texas afternoon. And he'd say, oh, clouds, 
Jesus is coming back in the clouds. Could it be today? And he, and he lived with that eager expectation. It could be any moment. And I can't wait to see him. In fact, at my dad's memorial service, a man came up to me who, who uh, had been flying remote control airplanes uh, with my dad. And the, the line control airplanes, I don't know if you've ever seen those, but you had the, these two little long strings and you sort of controlled the up and down and you, you went around in a circle flying this airplane up and down. I don't know how they didn't throw up, but they're out there flying these line control airplanes. And my dad says the same thing, look, look at those clouds. And his friend was not a believer. Look at those clouds. Jesus could come back today. You think it's today? And this man told me that um, on that day he went to his car, knowing that he was not right with the Lord, and he was convicted by that question, and he surrendered his life to Christ on that day. I never knew that until my dad's memorial service, and he came and told me that. That eager anticipation was the heartbeat of a man who had been forgiven of his sin and couldn't wait to see his Savior. That's the eager expectation. And it governs the life of a Christian. You're a citizen of a place you've never been, and you can't wait to be there. And you can't wait to be there because he's there. He's there. This would change the way you eat your cornflakes, hang out with friends, go to work, choose a spouse, raise your kids. Thinking about this every day. Asking that question in front of your kids. Could Jesus come back today? Thirdly, this evening, we will be changed. We will be changed. Look at verse 21. The Lord Jesus Christ will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. We will be changed. The Lord Jesus Christ will transform the body of our humble state, literally the body of our humiliation, and, and you might be looking around, doing a little comparison. You know, some people's bodies are a little more humiliating than other people's bodies. You might be thinking, man, I'm really humiliated by my physicality. I think what he's getting at here is that every physicality here pales in comparison to the glory which we will have in a resurrected state. When we in our physicality are brought into conformity with the glorious resurrection body of the Lord Jesus Christ... And we will look back at this week frame and say, oh, that was just a kernel from which this amazing thing sprouted. And this is what Paul gets at in 1 Corinthians 15. The seed that's sown has something to do with the plant that comes out. Uh, you're not going to get an apple tree from a watermelon seed. There's a relationship between that mortality, that physicality that is sown in the ground in weakness, that is raised in a new physicality in power, sown natural, raised supernatural. That's coming. That's the transformation that Paul is talking about here. This is one of the things we look forward to, being changed. And think about the body of our humiliation. What, what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15 is being sown in weakness. You think about the last moments of your life on this earth when you are at your physical, physical weakest point. Where your body can't sustain itself any longer. Either in some instantaneous tragedy or some long drawn out illness. Your last moments on this earth are your weakest, most ignominious, most ignoble, most humiliating, most fragile and frail. And you are as secure in those moments as you have ever, be, ever been as a Christian, uncondemnable and inseparable from the love of God, sustained by his power, but you will quit this mortal frame, this weak and merely natural frame, and be with Christ. And one day be united to a glorious resurrection physicality for which you were designed by God. The truth is you can't get in like you are. Your home country is not a realm you can enter in your present state. 
Physically, you couldn't be there in your present condition, and spiritually, you couldn't qualify in your present condition. Uh, We are mixed in our condition. There will be a day coming when the presence of sin and all of its residue will be totally and finally and permanently eradicated, and you will be able to stand in His presence blameless with great joy, as Jude 24 says. You must be changed. How are we qualified to experience this change? I'm going to give you a a crude illustration. I had an ant farm when I was a kid. You ever have an ant farm? Did your mom let you have an ant farm? I mean, the thought of, like, what if it falls off the shelf and those ants get all over? I don't think I want that. Well, my... My mom got me an ant farm, and, and it was this mail order thing, and the ants came in a little can, and the instructions said the ants like breakfast cereal, especially Special K. So I got Special K in a box, and I got these ants, and I got a little eyedropper of water and, and, and the, the sand in this little plexiglass thing that was just about wide enough for you to see ant tunnels, and they, they couldn't really go side to side, so you just got to see everything that they built. It was really fascinating. And every day I would carefully put an eyedropper of water in there at the top and a flake of special K and they'd, you know, eat it. And they build these intricate little tunnels. It's just amazing. Could you imagine one day if, if you went to the ant farm and discovered one of the ants was there upside down on the surface of the sand and an, one antenna bent and another broken off lying next to the carcass of your buddy that you named And you come back the next day and you find another ant mangled and dead. And and as the days go by, you just see more and more ants and you decide, I'm going to scope this out. I'm going to try to see what's happening. So you stay up real late and you watch. And you realize these, these ants have turned on one another. They're not working like a colony. They're not working together. They're not living up to their purpose I mean, here I am every single day, give them a a drop of water and a flake of special K. I mean, what more do they want from me? They have become a murderous mob and they're destroying their own colony. This is insanity. (sighs) Try to talk to the ants and they don't listen. You know what I would do? Take that little ant farm and start over, get a new can of ants. But what if you could try something? What if you could go down there and, 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 and start talking ant to them? You know, what if you could be an ant and, and, and walk through their tunnels? Kind of creepy thinking about it. Life-size ant and, and a murderous mobby ant that has laid up carcasses of other ants before you, and, and, and you're just going to go down there and you're going to, hey guys, get your act together. I, I'm just here to tell you, who are you and where are you from? Yeah, I'm not from around here, but, but I just want to give you a bigger perspective on life. You, you can ant better than this, and, and then you're the next victim. They tear you to pieces. I mean, really crude, silly illustration. But do you understand what God has done for us? In in taking on real human flesh and coming to the earth and coming to a humanity that was made in his image, designed for his glory, designed for enjoyment in the world that he made as his subregions on the earth. And murder in our hearts towards one another. With our fist in God's face, rebelling against His goodness and His kindness and His provision. And God dwelt among us. And He came to do what? Not just teach. He he certainly did that. But He came to lay down His life in our place and to take His life up again. Having satisfied His Father's wrath against our sin. Oh, the humility of our Savior, the the lowliness and the glory in the lowliness of our God, that He would love the likes of us, 
and at great cost to himself. He came into his own, his own received him not. He tabernacled among men. And what did we do? Listen, this is the only way that humans, rebels against God's goodness, could ever be qualified to be citizens in his heavenly home is if God makes a fundamental transformation in our nature. Having canceled out the debt of our sin and transforming us from the inside out and completing a transformation inside to the outside with full physicality to match a renewed spirituality. That is the change that Paul is describing here. Well, how could Jesus make all of this transformation? Notice the end of verse 21. By the exertion of the power that he possesses, even to subject all things to himself. Think about the power that Jesus has to bring into subjection all things. A broken and bent universe brought into subjection to his will. Demons that have to get permission from him. Satan on a short leash. Finally, Satan and his demons thrown into the lake of fire, which was prepared for them. And every enemy of Christ will bow the knee and will utter from the tongue that he is Lord to the glory of the Father, Philippians 2. Even during his earthly reign in the millennial kingdom, there will be believers and unbelievers, and his enemies will feign obedience to him. They will pretend because he reigns. And at the final judgment, there will be the elimination of all contenders. And Jesus will be glorified as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And every enemy tongue will have to admit it. Every knee will bow. He is Lord. And with that power that Jesus has to subject all things to himself, he has the power to transform you, Christian, to qualify you to be in his presence blameless with great joy so that you could enjoy the radiating glory of the combined total of his attributes shining out in blazing glory and not be incinerated by it. What a day that will be to be in his presence, to see him and to be conformed to his image, as far as it's possible for finite human beings to conform to the infinite glory of the second person of the Trinity, we will be conformed. And we're going to sing that song again. I'll close with a few words from Richard Baxter's Saints Everlasting Rest. He wrote, what a high favor that God will give us leave to love him that he would be embraced by those who have embraced lust and sin before. But more than this, he returns love for love, nay, a thousand times more. May the living God, who is the portion and rest of his saints, make these our carnal minds so spiritual and our earthly hearts so heavenly that loving him, delighting in him, may be the work of our lives. Lord Jesus, that is our prayer. The delighting in you, loving you, eagerly anticipating your return, our homegoing, the consummation and fulfillment of our citizenship in heaven. We want these to be the prevailing desires of our hearts. And we confess to you even now how easily we are distracted, how easily we are consumed by earthly things. We are tempted for our appetites to become our God. But you will have no rivals. And so we pray away every rival in our own hearts. God, we ask that you would win for our affections. And the result would be an eager anticipation of being with you that is contagious, infectious, producing in us a a, a, a rabid desire to be ambassadors of your goodness and your love and your kindness towards sinners. We pray even as we go out this evening that uh, you would open our eyes to the opportunities this week with the people that were around to tell how great you are 
to tell them the way of eternal life through your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.